this um, setting up everything for Damien. Um, like now to introduce a few of the people of distributors and manufacturers that have made this possible. Um, when I call your name, if you'd stand, please. Um, Michael Birch with BASF. Brady Faggers with Dow. Monty Quick with United Suppliers. Um, Matt Hayes with Arista. Drew Stevenson with Malin. Todd Depper Smith representing Monsanto Chemical and Seed today. Scott Barlow, USC, United Supplier Seed. Must have stepped out. Um, Corey Walt representing DuPont. And Rocky Bell representing CHS. Steve Penn with CFA. And from Servitech, Bryce Vance. Tyler Dakin with Syngenta. And then we have Nick Martin and uh, Luke Whitehill from Bayer. And then Don Johnson from EGE. Um, those are the manufacturers and distributors that make this possible every year. I think we should give them a hand because it's really good. Agriculture Trans Topics and Tomorrow's presented by Damian Mason. Damian was raised on a dairy farm and has a degree in agriculture economics from Purdue University. Mr. Mason travels extensively speaking to agriculture audiences and will share insights on issues facing the business of food production. When he's not traveling, Damian splits time between a winter home in Arizona and a 200 acre farm in Indiana. He and his wife have an all-natural beef operation. Although he admits he has no idea what that means, he just charges more for it. Please <laughs> <laughs> welcome Damien Mason. All right, fantastic. Uh, I really appreciate that, and I also want to thank the sponsors. I don't know who CFA is, but I stole one of your pins. <laughs> Who's a CFA person? Right over here. Okay. I, what, what do you do? I mean, we've all heard of DuPont and Dow and BASF and Bayer and then the company that's going to be Chinese in another couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, is Sinjina here? Is Sinjina here? Yeah. Okay, Sinjina, you better learn Mandarin fast. <laughs> what the hell is CFA do? We finance the inputs uh, of the Garden City Co-op to their customers. You furnish the inputs to them? Finance. Finance. Oh, your money! Yeah. Money! That's all you need to say, brother, right there, money. <laughs> because, you know, when Tim was thanking the sponsors, I want to thank the sponsors also. I got paid. I flew here from Phoenix, Arizona to Dallas, Fort Worth, had time for lunch, flew into Garden City yesterday afternoon, evening, came over here, looked at all the room, found out the good people from Garden City Co-op were so excited about having me that they didn't have a room booked for me. <laughs> <laughs> Cowboys get to stay. I mean, it's fine. No, I appreciate this. I do appreciate the sponsors. I very much do. I walked through the room over there. I stole a pen. I thought about taking a koozie. You know, checking things out. The cow guy over here, he's seen me for that in Denver, right? Did we do anything in Denver for you guys? And I just want to point this out. I get paid to go around and deliver speeches at corporate events, principally agriculture. So I'm an agriculture guy. You heard I'm a farm boy and, and all that kind of stuff. I have been criticized by different organizations. Uh, people, you know, the PETA and the Environmental Working Group and all these wackos that don't like what we do in food production. On social media, and I'd like you guys to follow me on uh, at Damien Mason, my Twitter handle, and Damien Mason, professional speaker on Facebook, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I'd like you to keep up with me because some of these wackos, I got called a couple years ago, they said, you're just a shell for factory food production. You're nothing but a mouthpiece for Monsanto. 
I got called that by uh, one of my detractors. I said, let's point this out. Uh, I'm going to correct you. I'm not a mouthpiece for Monsanto. I also do paid gigs for DuPont, Dow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm not a mouthpiece for Monsanto. I'm a whore of the highest bidder. <laughs> OK. So I appreciate you making me a part of this. I have been here before to Garden City, Kansas, in this very room for the competition of Garden City Co-op CPS. Was anybody here a couple years ago when I did that deal? Fantastic. I'm going to be a lot better today than I was two years ago. <laughs> We're going to talk about this business of agriculture. We're going to talk about it from a different perspective. I, I can talk to you about agronomic stuff. We can talk about, uh, you know, everything down to the heads in the, the soil and, and organic, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects of the soil profile and this kind of thing, glyphosate, 2,4-D, all this kind of crap. But I mean, you can talk to these reps about that all day long. Let's talk about the business of agriculture today. That's what we're going to talk about with our time together. Um, big picture kind of stuff. You're in the business of food. So let's take this sort of from a 30,000 foot level, if you will. I travel all over the United States doing this. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick lowdown. By the way, it's kind of a big deal. I've been paid to do gigs in all 50 states. That's a big deal. When you're a paid talker and you can cross off, it took me 18 and a half years to cross off Mississippi. <laughs> They're slow. I mean, you know, <laughs> they make like KU graduates seem sharp by comparison. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, there I was in Belzona, Mississippi. I opened my show. I said, Thank you, Mississippi. You're dead last. You're number 50. You're the bottom of the list, but I'm here to do a paid show. An old man in the front row raised his hand and said, Dang it, we're last in every other category, too. <laughs> so, it's a big deal to work all around. I'm going to kind of get to know you and you can get to know me. I think I understand you are farmers in, in, in western Kansas. I think I understand that. Tim Gasek and I had a couple of calls to talk about you guys. I've learned a little bit about what you people do. You're saying, how's a guy getting this line of work going around talking to ag events? Well, I wasn't always talking to ag events. I, in 1993, quick little story here, I was a lighting fixture salesman in San Diego, California. It's what you do when you have an agricultural economics degree from Purdue, you go sell lighting fixtures in Southern California. <laughs> On Halloween 1993, I won $500 in a costume contest dressed up as Bill Clinton. Uh, some of you older people obviously see I might resemble a little bit of Bill Clinton. Some of you younger kids, he was the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've always been able to imitate people. My whole life, I could imitate the teachers at school, the principals, even the nuns at catechism. In Catholics? Yeah, I did. I did get Catholic a little bit. There's no Catholics in here. Lutherans, Methodists, they're all generally the same. It's just Catholics are more guilty when they drink. Uh, <laughs> I picked on the Catholics. My dad was a Catholic monk for two years as a young man. He joined the monastery when he was very young. Uh, he dropped out of the monastery, became a father the old-fashioned way. That's a screwing joke right there, ladies and gentlemen. We can laugh at that. The Mennonites are here, all right? Okay, the point is, you guys are ag folks. You can appreciate this. When you keep the bull away from the heifers, you have what we call pent-up demand. My dad dropped out of the monastery and had nine kids. <laughs> it's a pent-up demand there. I slept in the corner of my parents' bedroom in a crib until I was six years old because I was the youngest. Is there anybody youngest in here? Okay, anybody from the big family? Nobody understands this anymore. Brandon, what was that like growing up in a big family on a farm in Indiana? Well, it was like being Amish, but we had electricity. <laughs> Uh, they don't understand what that's like. Did all nine of you kids work on the farm? I Hell no. Like like. Just like here at Garden City Co-op, half of us did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand, big families. I mean, I slept in the corner of my parents' room in a crib until I was six because there was no more room. People don't understand that. You know, they have one point two kids in the suburbs of America. They don't understand what's like. Big family, we, no room. You know that thing about goldfish growing to the size of their bowl? I might have been in the NBA, but I was stuck in a crib until I was six years old. <laughs> Did a game for the National Pork Board, the protesters. 
Mr. Factory Food Man, Mr. Shill for Factory Food, you, you know it's inhumane to keep those sows, those little kids. Like, hell, I was in a crib until I was six. What were you doing? <laughs> they say funny stuff. They, you know it's not humane the way we treat those animals in those factory farms. When we crowd them, corral them, pin them up, push them. I said, have you ever been to Disney World? <laughs> you know how good I never protest how they treat the humans. <laughs> so anyway, that's my background. I became a professional Bill Clinton person, a political comedian. That's how I got into this line of work. I quit my job in July of 1994. I was 25 years old. I've been a salesman for two years. I decided I'm going to be a political comedian. So I dressed up as Bill Clinton. I would put on fat padding, make up to age myself, gray hair, charcoal suit. And I could talk about Bill Clinton. I go around letting people laugh and I do funny shows talking. You guys don't get the news up here, otherwise I'll get the news. I show something girls when I leave when I say I'm a hands on politician. <laughs> so I quit my job to become a professional Bill Clinton uh, comedian, a, a impersonator. Uh, that's how I made my living for a long, long time. I do not do Bill Clinton anymore. A lot of people say that. <laughs> I don't do no Clinton anymore. I might be rolling it back out. In fact, if, uh, what's going on? We don't know. We just <coughs> Bernie Sanders in New Hampshire last night. A good guy. Who knows? We're going to see what happens. But that's how I've got it. He's doing about 100 political comedy shows at corporate events all over the United States of America. Obviously, in 2001 and two, things started to change. So I uh, started doing this. I went back to my roots and created a presentation that was comedic and started talking about agriculture because I know about agriculture. Uh, and then a few years ago, uh, people said, hey, we know this is funny and you can talk about agriculture, but we want you to talk about these issues. So what this really is, what we're going to share here today is, I'm a farm boy and I've got observations from a career for 22 years of traveling around the country, North America, doing Canada and the United States. And I read every day. I read the Wall Street Journal, USA Today. I read stuff that you guys don't read. I read stuff that you don't see. I am around people that you are not around. I live part-time in the suburbs of Phoenix. I am around suburban people. So I'm going to share with you some of that stuff. To be a comedian is to actually be a professional observer. So I'm going to give you my observations for the news, okay? That's what we're going to talk about here. So now you got it. Oh, Jesus, that's not good. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing back on. Caleb, if I need you, you get up here, okay, buddy? <laughs> All right, there we go. Let's start at the very beginning. This business that we are in, this business of food production, is the basis for all societal development. We would not be where we are as a society were it not for food production. We probably get that more than the average person, okay? The cobbler couldn't make shoes until somebody else grew food so the cobbler could specialize in growing uh, and, and making shoes, right? <coughs> there would be no Silicon Valley where they're not a San Joaquin Valley. So bearing that in mind, the foundation for societal advancement has always been food production. The third world countries, the places that have starvation and political unrest, 70% of their population works in food production, okay? So just think about that. Where we are as a society is we're so advanced, so economically viable as a nation, but it's because we are so good at that. So that's the big picture thing. I understand agriculture. I've told you my roots. I'll even go one further for you. You people are Western Kansans. Some of you people are huge operations. Tim told me we got people in here at lots and lots of acres. Mine are a little bit more humble. My grandfather came to this country on a boat. He milked cows for people as a herdsman. He worked in Minot, North Dakota, Troy, Ohio, ultimately ended up in Huntington, Indiana. My mom is 88 years old. She lives on the first farm owned by a mason in the United States of America. My father, as an eight-year-old boy, lost his left arm. At age 21, the insurance company gave him a death and dismemberment settlement. He took that money and put it down on the farm. My mom lives on the first farm. It was literally paid for. My dad put his arm down on the farm. My father's not been with us since 1999. Uh, my mom uh, lives there, and there's a, they have a chunk of ground across the road. I live a couple miles north on a farm that I bought. People understand that. David, you have a 200 acre farm. And I know 200 acres isn't a big deal out here, but there's something different. In Indiana, ground is a little bit more than this much of Kansas. We have this magical thing called precipitation. <laughs> Which is really funny. When I went through the vendor room over there, why the hell are you bothering giving these things out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't stick these out. You know, all your rain comes in a perfect circle. Why are you fooling with this? You know, I don't understand. I think I'm taking this home. But uh, uh, anyway, it's Servitech. Uh, by the way, thank you for your money. 
<laughs> People don't understand it. They say things like, now, David, you don't have a farm. Did you inherit the whole farm? Well, hell no. I'm ninth. <laughs> when you're ninth, you don't inherit nothing but a willingness to fist fight the older kids in the family. That's it. That's my farm. That's me and my brown Swiss dairy cow. She was a champion brown Swiss dairy cow in 1981. She was the only brown Swiss cow at the fair that year. <laughs> That's my all natural beef operation. I sell all natural beef to you know quarters of beef. And I'm a pretty big operator. I drove by the speed yard out here by the airport, and I was thinking I should stop in and teach them a thing or two. I did 14 steers last year. <laughs> pretty big operator. I get my steers every uh, beginning of May. I'm done by Thanksgiving, so I can go to Phoenix. I sell quarters of beef to people from town. Man, is it all natural? It's got to be all natural. You're going to sell a quarter of beef to your friends from town. Is it all natural? Right? Yeah! It's not a robot. Looks natural to me. The other welfare over there is true as cut. How natural is that? Is it black Angus? It's got to be a black Angus. You're going to sell a quarter of beef to a friend from town. It's got to be a black Angus, right? Because the certified black Angus program is convinced. Brainwash people. It's got to be black Angus. They use your beef as a black Angus. Yeah. Two years ago, I'm a better salesman than I am a beef producer. I oversold my inventory. <laughs> so I went to my brother, the dairyman. Hell, two of my customers got black and white Angus. <laughs> agriculture. Uh, and by the way, I know this is being shot. This uh, AV man is shooting me, so he's going to make it available uh, for people that couldn't attend today. There's also, there's a gentleman right over here. I'd like you to make it available for you. It's on his hat. He's been on his phone the whole damn time I've been up here talking. <laughs> so since you really don't want to listen now, maybe your stupid ass can listen next week. You, know? <laughs> you could just put his phone down and pay attention today and not have to watch it on video. Just an idea. I mean, it's just... Just tonight, because I'm here and you're here, it'd make it easier. <laughs> you're looking at my little fun pictures. Well, if you're that type of fan, go back to being on your phone. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Here's, here's what we've got to understand about this business of agriculture. It's not about us. And this is hard for us. Now I'm going to start maybe pushing you a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you glowing stuff. I go to these ag meetings. I've been going to them since I was a little kid. I'm 46 years old. I've seen the person come in here in his bib overalls and his, and his straw hat and talk to you like hee-haw. Tell you how wholesome y'all are. Oh yeah, we're farmers. We work hard. Fantastic. Nobody gives a damn. That's why we're in business. We're in business because of those people right there. They are our customers. There is a myth that you're self-employed. I'll call it the self-employment myth. David, you're lucky. You go around and you talk to audiences for a living. You're self-employed. I'm not self-employed. I work for you. Today, I work for the Garden City Co-op. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm working for Channel Seeds in Louisville, Kentucky at the Farm Machinery Show. <coughs> it was a co-op in, uh, in, in Eastern Nebraska. You know what I'm saying? It's always a different. I work, for, I work for different people. I work for organizations, associations. You don't work for yourself. Think of it this way. Every dollar you're going to earn for the rest of your life, is currently in someone else's pocket. All right? That's just the best way I can present this to you. You don't work for yourself. You work for customers. We work, well, I work, I sell my stuff. Doesn't matter where you sell your stuff to. I listened to the radio broadcast coming from the airport yesterday where they gave the ag numbers. What, you know, over Scott City, the price is this. Over in Dodge City, the price is this. It don't matter what you all know it for is them, the consumers right there. They are who we work for. And they have numbers, okay? You've seen these numbers before. I'm going to help you out here. Do me a favor. You're a smart guy. What are those numbers? And by the way, I asked the guy this two years ago at one of my shows, and he said, 99. Well, I said, no, not the numerals on the screen. What do they represent? You probably know what they represent, right? What do they represent? Percentages, right? Okay. I'll help you out. I'll just tell you what they stand for. Okay? There we go. <laughs> You've probably seen and heard this before, that 1% of America farms, only 1%. By the way, if you sit up front, you're going to get something for free. People are like, oh, so up front, we picked on you. You're going to get picked on. I'm going to involve you, and you're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to get free crap. You want something free? <laughs> Just because I involve? Okay, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> you get a meat thermometer from United Supplies, okay? There's one less thing you're going to have to draw right there. <laughs> We live in a country of 320 million 
million people. There's 320 million people in the United States of America, we think. We haven't really had a southern border for two years. Could be a lot more than that. We don't know. Out of the 320 million people, 3.2 million people are farmers. You got that? That's 99.1. 1 percent of this country farms. You've heard the thing that only 1 or 2 percent. I'll give you the numbers. It's not even 1 percent. Some people say, is it 2 percent of America that farms? No. According to the National Ag Statistics Service, 3.2 million farmers on 2.1 million farms. However, the definition of farm is probably not what you think. I am in the top 40 percent of farmers in the United States of America, not counting the ground that I cash rent. I rent out 125 of my acres, you know, to real farmers. I make eight acres of alfalfa and I did 14 steers last year. I'm in the top 40 percent of farmers in the United States of America. The bottom under uh, is 57 percent. 57 percent of farms do not sell $10,000 worth of product per year. Okay, so when these numbers get recited to you, actually, when people say crazy stuff like, I just don't like these big factory farms, these big corporate farms, well, you better like them because the other people ain't gonna feed this room. Okay, so that's what you need to understand. 1% is really about one third of 1% that are anything sub of our population. One, one third of 1% probably are producing almost all the food. 93 to 7, 7% 7 of this country is involved, 7% of this population is involved peripherally in the business of food and agriculture, okay? So at best, we're up number 93 to 7. 83 to 17, 83% of this country lives in a urban or suburban large metropolitan area. 17% live out in what we call rural areas. Where do we have feed yards? Where do we produce pigs? Where do we grow corn? Where do we make milk? Where do we produce eggs? Where do we grow soybeans? You guys understand. So our detractors, those that do not like what we do in agriculture, appeal to the 83% that live in the Chicago's and the Kansas City's and the Denver's. Does that make sense to you? So just to give you a scale of what we're talking about here. The customers love, there's a new movement, right? The foodie crowd, they want to know where their food comes from. That's a big thing now. And if you didn't know that, because maybe you're working for the Art Iron Western Kansas, I will tell you that that is part of it. I, again, I live part time in the suburbs, and I'm on the road about 150 days a year doing stuff like this. Big movement to be close to your food. I want to know where my food comes from. But they don't really want to understand it, they just want to feel like they do. Seven years ago, I'm on a tour at the Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream Facility in Vermont. I had a gig to do that evening. I'm, I'm there. I want to go check things out. I'm raised on a dairy farm. I worked in a ceiling tile factory for three years when I was in college. I like to see how things are made, and I love ice cream. So think about that. I like an ice cream dairy farmer. love to see how things are made. This is a perfect thing for me. The only thing is I didn't like my tour that much because I didn't really talk about that much about how much things are made. They mostly talk about how they recycle because they got to appeal to all that crunchy goofball stuff, right? One of the tourists, 24 of us, let's say, walking over the catwalk, looking down at the filling room where those little pints of Ben and Jerry's are going through the conveyor. And one of the tourists stopped the tour and said, oh my God, what is in that barrel? And the tour guide said, man, that's caramel. We're making caramel soup for today. Food grade cardboard barrel lined with this cream with a pump coming out of it going into each little pint. The woman turned to us and says, oh my God, it reminds me to never eat anything with caramel and it caramel comes from a barrel. I'm a fairly outspoken individual. I said, you stupid bit lady. So where do you think caramel comes from? The caramel fairy? And I'm sharing this with you because as much as consumers today in 2016 will tell you they care about where their food comes from and they want to be close to their farmer and they want to eat locally, they don't really want to see any of the behind the scenes stuff. If they're bothered by a damn caramel barrel, what about when you tell them you clip needle teeth and pigs? What about when you tell them that the Garden City Co-op will sell you anhydrous? Anhydrous? What's that? If they know what ammonia is at all, they're going to say, let's see, anhydrous. Oh, I read about that in the newspaper. It's how you make meth, right? If they're very into the news, they might remember that two years ago, some poor little town called West Texas got obliterated, blown off the map because of nitrogen ammonia, right? So think about this. We touch every day stuff that these people are bothered by. If they're bothered by caramel in a barrel, think of how they're going to be bothered by what you do for a living every day. <coughs> I'm just giving you an idea that now you understand the disconnect. We go out there and tell them stuff. Like, I'll give you a great example. 
I went to the dairy conference a few years ago. I got a panelist, a panel of three dairymen up there. One of them said, okay, they're going to learn how to talk to the media. And they said, the Humane Society says you mistreat your cattle. How do you respond? He said, well, I would say that's ridiculous. Well, we depend on these animals for our living. We've got to be good to them. You know who else said that? Plantation owners in the 1800s. How'd that work out? Okay, I'm not being mean, I'm not being racist, I'm being straight with you. Okay, then he said, I would tell those people that when we have to dehorn a heifer calf, we put it in a squeeze chute so it cannot move. And we extract the horn and then we cauterize the wound and we spray it with lidocaine. <laughs> the average consumer has to take a week of bereavement when their canary dies. And what the hell did you just tell them? <laughs> you, what the hell? What's that happen? And you do what? You put them in a can, you squeeze them so they can't move, you extract their horn so it's bleeding, then you put a, a hot piece of metal on it, then you spray it with drugs. <laughs> That's what the consumer just heard. Do you understand where I'm going with this? We need to realize how disconnected they are from what we do every day. This also leads to an increasingly bad thing for us, the politics of agriculture. They watch Dr. Oz. Have you guys ever seen Dr. Oz? I've watched it for research. It's a daytime show made for idiots. You know what else Dr. Oz has, though? He has a legion of followers that are uh, just, he has a book, or I mean, he has his, his magazines, every magazine has a picture of him. It's called The Good Life of Dr. Oz. And he tells people about, he's a damn doctor. He tells people about miracle diets. And he tells them about magic new superfoods. Let me tell you something. There's no such thing as superfood. Nor is there any such thing as cleansing or miracle diets. There is a thing called, you know, portion control, eating a variety of food, and sweating your ass off at the gym. But that does not work for Dr. Oz's viewers. He also told them that GMOs should be outlawed. So they lined up like the sheep they are, and they sent a petition with a couple million signatures on it to, Dr. to President Obama, saying GMOs should be illegal. Remember the numbers? 3.2 million farmers on 2.1 million farms, and he can get, he has a couple million daily viewers, and they're signing a petition. So when you think the politics of agriculture is going to go away, it's only going to get worse, because we're not nothing. And so this GMO labeling stuff that we hear about, where's that going to end up? I'll tell you where it is. Like, I wrote an article, and I put it out there a year ago, I said, fine, stop fighting. Let it be labeled. The sooner it gets labeled, the more it becomes ubiquitous. Just like on every pack of cigarettes, there's a label. Just like on every other piece of food you buy, it's got a, a circle with a U-reference, which means parve, which is a Jewish thing. It doesn't even mean anything to you. Fine, stick the damn GMO label on there. What difference does it make? Let's stop fighting the labeling thing and just say, put it on everything. Because then it becomes something the consumer doesn't even see. You understand where I'm going with this? Stop fighting these battles that we understand and just fight the bigger picture of, fine, fine, we're outnumbered, we're outnumbered, fine, go with it. I'll be as much of a GMO spokesman as you ever want. But I say, go ahead and put the labels on there. That's the next politics of food argument, right? USDA, we always know how this goes. It's always going to be a politics of food. We've seen this before. We'll never see it again. We have people who want to control consumption. Good example. And you know that the US Department of Agriculture puts out every five years a thing called the Nutrition Guidelines. You guys have seen this, right? Yeah, I, I, seriously, I'm, I'm here to help you and educate you. If you didn't know this, it began in 1980, the Dietary Nutritional Guidelines, supposed to be instructing Americans on what they should eat. Began in 1980, the president appoints the commission. So to think it's not political is ridiculous, because Ronald Reagan probably appointed a different set of people than Barack Obama did, right? Now this thing has got, every five years they come out and tell America what to eat, in case you didn't see it. This was the first year that they came out and told me what to eat, and they brought in a new thing that wasn't just about diet and nutrition. This was the first time they said you should not eat meat because, did anybody see this? Because it's bad for the environment. So if you think that's not a political statement, it had nothing to do with food, nothing to do with, it had to do with food, food, it had to do with nutrition, it had to do with environment. Michelle Obama thinks that kids are fat. And she decides because of whole milk and 2% milk. In the schools of America right now, you can only get skim milk. Did you guys know that? I don't have kids, but if you do, you should know that. That happened two years ago. Michelle Obama has never been elected to an office in her life. She has never been appointed. She has not even had a job. But she changed the composition of the school lunch. Do you think there's not a politics of food in agriculture? There is. By the way, I'll go ahead and tell you. You guys want a quick phone? If you want Bill Clinton or you want children? Which one do you want? You're a bald guy sitting up front. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you want Bill Clinton? <clears throat> So they were talking to me about the Obamas. I 
they said, what do you think about this thing with uh, Michelle Obama? You know, let me just tell you something. These two are screwed up. Barack Obama's put 50 million people on food stamps. 50 million people. He's, put, he's feeding them, feeding them, feeding them. And Michelle Obama keeps going around saying there's too many fat kids. <laughs> You guys see the problem here? <laughs> He's feeding them, feeding them, feeding them, and she's saying there's too many fat kids. And they said, well, what would you do differently? I said, I would cut out the middle man. I think what we ought to do is just feed them fat kids to the skinny kids. <laughs> <laughs> that other picture right there is Michael Bloomberg. You guys, does anybody know who Michael Bloomberg is? Michael Bloomberg was the mayor of New York City. Right now, in the news this morning, coming here and I was working out at the Hotel Tim, I found out that Michael Bloomberg is still very much considering a run as a third party independent candidate for President of the United States of America. He's the one that's worth billions of dollars, he fights the NRA, he opposes to certain things and puts his money towards it, he began the Bloomberg News Network, and he is now in his early 70s an out-of-work politician and wants to do something and spend his money and time doing something. So what did he do with his what, mayor of New York City? He outlawed pop over 16 ounces. You guys remember that? He said there's too many fat people because of soda pop being more than 16 ounces. So he outlawed it. The Supreme Court overruled that, then it came back to being regulated again. It still is an issue in the courts. Michael Bloomberg might be president of the United States, and he outlawed pop. You don't think that's going to affect what you do in this, in this room right here? Well, I don't know, baby. I'm a farmer. I don't care. You don't care. You don't care that a politician is controlling what people eat. You sure as hell do care. Okay? Again, we're talking big picture. We're talking big picture about this. By the way, I drink pop. I'm the only one in this room that got one. The giant nice gentleman from the clarion went back and got me a Coke. Because I like Coke. You know why? Because Pepsi sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Pepsi is like flat pancake syrup, is it? <laughs> I used to be a bartender in college. You realize that Pepsi is so crappy of a product, you can't even make it better by putting booze in it. <laughs> Nobody ever gave them an order of Jack and Pepsi. <laughs> Can I have a rum and Pepsi? No! Pepsi's all. I didn't get soda pop growing up. I'll bet you the older people in this room agree with me. I'm 46 years old. Young kids today think you get soda pop all the time. Older people, you got soda pop growing up on special occasions, right? Remember that? And by at the Mason Farm, we got soda pop on special occasions. And by special, I mean someone had influenza. <laughs> yeah. Seven up, right? Some people thought ginger ale cured the flu. Let me you, ginger ale smells like barf. <laughs> seven up is disgusting. We got, I hate seven up. You know what? Seven up does not cure the flu, but they'll cure you from ever liking seven up. <laughs> See it on the table, you think your brother's on the bottom of it. It's disgusting. <laughs> okay, so I'm telling you about this because every, and if, if here's something else you should know. The dietary nutritional guidelines that your government puts out through the United States Department of Agriculture, telling people what to eat to be healthy, began in 1980, they just did it again to 2015, every five years. In 1980, the obesity rate in the United States of America was just under 12%. We now are at 36%. We are so good at telling people what to eat to be healthy, we have tripled the obesity rate in 35 years. Now you understand what we should be opposing. If there's a politics of food and agriculture, instead of trying to get on the ballot, instead of sending our lobbyists out there in Washington to make sure that more potatoes are in the school lunch program, we ought to just go with a big PR thing to the United States citizenry and say, this government is telling you what to eat, it's controlling what you eat, look at what they've done to you. That's what we should do. Okay. And that's what I'll bring me to my next point. The business of agriculture should be a better fighting organization. I. That is fine. Is it? You need to take the call. I don't do Thank you for voting for Hillary. <laughs> Instead of, because what we do in agriculture, we do not fight well. We do not fight well. I want you to really think about this. Whether it's, whether it's the business angle or the, the lobbying groups that oppose us, the non-GMO project, the environmental liberation front, the environmental working group, all these groups that do not like what we do in agriculture, and plus there's the damn government that we are always so afraid that they're not going to keep giving us our, 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 our subsidy or our, our uh, propped up uh, crop insurance, that we refuse to fight them. But you know what? We should fight the way the NRA does. 
That's who that is right there. Does everybody know that? You're giving away two guns over here. How many people knew who that was? That's Wayne LaPierre, the executive vice president of the National Rifle Association. Oh my God, David, you're comparing guns to agriculture? Yes, I am, and I'll tell you what. The NRA has three and a half million members. They say five million. Their detractors say three and a half million. Don't matter. I'm a member. I get the magazine. I get the $35 a year, whatever it is. Doesn't matter, because the point is, in 320 million people in this country, you've got three and a half to five million that are members. But they're formidable. How many farmers are there? About 3.2 million. So the numbers are roughly the same. Why else am I comparing guns to food? Because if a food disease breaks out, is it top of the news or is it buried on page 12? It's top of the news. If a gun shooting happens in Connecticut, is it top of the news or is it buried on page 12? Okay, there's no reason to compare food and guns. People are very emotional about these two. The news media wants to sell advertising. The news media wants you to tune in, to log on to their website, to buy their magazines and their newspapers, to be a subscriber. They're not about information. They're about selling. So the news media uses these two topics, guns and food issues, because when you sell fear, people dial in. Does that make sense? Shootings, food issues, E. coli, right? Peanut contamination. Oh my God, bluebell ice cream. <coughs> One person died. Oh Jesus, you should be more sensitive, Dave. Yeah, I made a crack about bluebell once, and everybody said, Cubans died. One person out of 320 million people died over damn ice cream. And I'm supposed to act like this is the biggest catastrophe in the world? You know what? Texting and driving killed one person yesterday. The point I would make to you is they use food to scare people to tune in. They use guns for the same reasons. Let's learn a lesson from the NRA. The NRA, you know what they do an amazing job of? Fighting. You know what America farmers do? You know what agriculture does? Same thing. We've been doing this since I was a little kid. When ag is under attack, we bring out a guy in a plaid shirt. Always have to be a plaid shirt because I'm looking from you. I'm looking right now. Farmers have two outfits: plaid and free crap from the chemical companies. <laughs> <laughs> you guys look like an army of Scotsmen from where I'm standing. Right? <laughs> so you bring out your farmer and his plaid, and you have his beautiful wife and his cute little kids, and you put them on a hay bale in front of a barn, and you say, "We're American agriculture. We work hard." Now, we've never won a battle fighting that way, but by God, we'll keep going back to the well. hundred years isn't too many times of losing the battle. What's the NRA do when they're under attack? They come out hell fire. They come out with lawyers and media professionals, and, they come, and they're not afraid to take a stand. When's the last time the Farm Bureau ever actually took a stand? Well, we'd like it if you consider appealing and maybe not putting through the waters of the U.S. I'd smack the guy from Farm Bureau if that's all he had. But you don't do it with the damn NRA. They've got emotion and passion. So you know what? Learn how to fight like the NRA does. They do an excellent job of it. I always ask the question to the people of agriculture. Do you want to be bikers or rich women in fur coats? What are you talking about, Damien? About a decade ago, it became very trendy for the animal rights activists to go to Rodeo Drive, Fifth Avenue, with a can of red spray paint, beautiful woman in a fur coat, walking down the sidewalk. She's pretty harmless, isn't she? They go up with a can of red spray paint and damage, vandalize her jacket to prove that they don't think it's humane for you to wear an animal skin. Now, those little bastards never went to a biker bar and pulled that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because they get beat up, right? <laughs> so the question is, in the business of agriculture, do you want to be bikers or rich women for a coast? We're getting pushed around. We still get pushed around. So that's what I would say. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand about the way the NRA does it. We use science. It's ridiculous. As an industry, we tell people, well, GMOs are safe. I'll show you the clinical trials that prove the science behind GMOs. Americans don't understand science. They don't care about economics. Remember the plantation owner said that you would wreck the South economy if you got rid of slavery. Did that hold up? No. There's an emotional argument that won. I'm not being mean. I'm just being frank with you. They said the economy of the South was predicated on slavery. That didn't hold water, did it? We say the economy, we say the science. What's the NRA use? They use those things right there. Here's how the NRA does it. Those wackos want to take away your guns. That's self-interest. What do they use? They use emotion. You remember 
when you and I go to grandson on Thanksgiving, you hunted rabbits, how wonderful that was, and that was a legacy that your grandfather did with you. That's emotion. You know, it's your Second Amendment right to own a firearm. This country is founded by people that rebelled against and overzealous governments, and they had firearms to do it. That's patriotism. National defense. You know, we never once won a war, we just outproduced the competition. That's national defense. Guns, of course, they say. When we get invaded by ISIS, don't you want to be able to protect your family? Think of how they argue. Why don't we do this with agriculture? National defense. We never want a war. We have to produce the competition. Why don't we still good at producing food? Patriotism. This country was founded by agricultural people. Thomas Jefferson was a farm owner. We are an agricultural country. The reason we became a dominant force was because we conquered the West by growing food. Emotion. Don't you want to be in charge of what you eat? Don't you want to be in charge of what your family is? Isn't it wonderful we have these choices and those organizations want to take away your choice? Self-interest. Hey, Bubba, you like bacon? Then the do-gooders want to take it away from you. By God, Bubba will fight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's my point. The next point I'm going to make to you is do not use the science. I've told you this already. When we talk about the business we are in, do not use the You can tell people the science if they're intelligent people. Let's say you're sitting there drinking a beer and you're on vacation and someone says, well, now you said you're a farmer. What's about all these GMOs? Go ahead and tell them about it if they actually are dialing in, but in general they won't. And you can't use the science because this is an important study. Two years ago, February of 2014, two years ago, National Science Foundation did a poll. 26% of Americans do not know that the Earth revolves around the sun. One in four Americans do not know that the Earth goes around a circle and the sun is at the middle. Did you understand that? And you're going to tell them why GMOs on a scientific basis are safe for the family. I am not from a well-educated background. I was raised in Huntington, Indiana. They're not smart people there. The county has one high school. They call it Huntington North. <laughs> True story. They've never had a southeast or west. I'm just planning ahead for four years. <laughs> Me and Dan Quayle are both from Huntington and Ed. You know that? Some of you old people remember Dan Quayle. Some of you younger people. He was the vice president we thought was stupid, and then we got war. <laughs> then we got Biden. Okay? Dan Quayle, people, what's the bar you and Quayle are from? Well, Huntington North High School, they don't teach driver's training and sex education on the same day. But the school's only got one car. <laughs> what you think about that? <laughs> My elementary school, we didn't have one of those little things with the, you know, the planets, little models. You guys know what I'm talking about? We didn't have, you don't need one of those. You need a little model to learn how the damn solar system works with a sun in the middle and, you know, Mercury. You guys can name them. Venus, Earth, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus. Mercury. Uh, what's one of them? Pluto. They took it away, now they gave it back. <laughs> You didn't have all those little things. You know what? You want to learn how the solar system works here at poor school? You take the fattest kid in the yellow shirt and you put him in the middle. <laughs> you call him the sun. <laughs> you're in a blue shirt, you're Earth. You walk around here. <laughs> all right, so you can't use that. Now, here's a point that I would make to you. This is an important point for you. I came up with a sound bite about seven or eight years ago. I decided the American people need sound bites. They do not need science. I told you to sit up front and get something for free. You work for uh, I can't give it to you, I'm going to give it to a customer, right? Bumper sticker. On the way out the door, I'm going to leave a stack of them on that table if you want free bumper sticker, I'll give these to you. Can't use science. Very simple stuff. Agriculture, because starvation sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Most people tend to understand this. You get that, in case they, in case they don't know, I want you to have that. My new sticker I came up with just last year that's just neater than heck. If you eat it, drink it, or smoke it, agriculture produced it. <laughs> now you're laughing. I did a gig in Colorado. They love these things. <laughs> Frankly, you look like you might be appropriate. <laughs> All right. We haven't found yet. We're going to tell those people that are watching on, on the video that you know what? If you'd come here, you'd have this much fun, right? Just work on your phone, you know, send texts, whatever. It's all good. 
All right, let's go ahead and move on now to the next phase of what we have to talk about. I told you up front, this is what we do is a business. What you people do is a business. I know this. I was raised on that dairy farm. I did the work. I mean, I saw the milk check coming in every two weeks. I know about this thing. It's a business. The American consumer doesn't understand this. Well, Damien, I just think it'd be nice if it was more pastoral, like the old days. Because, you know, these factory farms, these industrial farms, these corporate agriculture, all those terms, by the way, were invented by people that are with PR agencies that oppose production agriculture as we know it. Okay? There's a whole lot of money being made by not-for-profits. Never think that not-for-profit means not-for-profit. The GMO project, the GMO verification, all these kinds of things. Remember, uh, the anti-meat crowds, whatever. So we understand this is a business. And that's why we're talking about thinking about this business. I told you about the dietary nutrition guidelines. As quickly as, as possible, in your head, I want you to absorb this. This pyramid that we've talked about a number of times in the business of food is really not the pyramid that motivates America. The food pyramid is not the real pyramid for us in food production and food marketing and food selling. Okay? There's a pyramid that I think that you need to really be more aware of. It's that pyramid. That guy right back there in the Kansas State sweater and jacket. You've been to Kansas State. Did they teach you psychology 101? Did you ever take a psychology class? Yeah, I had to. Do you happen to know what that is? Yeah, it's the basic needs that you need to survive. And once you start moving up the basically more money, you start moving farther up the food. That's why you got to send your kids to Manhattan, Kansas. They're going to be as smart as that guy right there. <laughs> That's true. Everything he said. Maslow was the psychiatrist that developed this. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. What that gentleman just said is dead on, in case you didn't hear it. The more money you make, the more you move up that pyramid. At the bottom are basic needs, food, water, shelter. Then you move up from there. The point is, in the United States of America, how many folks do you think are at the bottom with food, water, and shelter? Very few. We give 47 million people food stamps. Those same people do not pay for heat, they do not pay for rent, they do not pay for school lunches, nor school breakfast. I am not being mean, I am being honest. 15% of our country essentially pays for nothing. There are people right above them that might be struggling a bit. But then there's a huge, huge layer. The middle and upper middle class layer. That are not motivated by just food, water, shelter. They're motivated by need, by cause, by being involved. As that man just told you, the more money they make, the more they want to be their needs change. Now it's being a cause, being part of something, giving money to environmental causes, giving money to charitable groups. And that's what we must understand. We say, how does this relate to me, Damien? I'm in food production. Because what we do in agriculture is still based on 1950s thinking. Cheap food. I argue with the Farm Bureau about this all the time. They, they can't help themselves. They, they still put up press releases telling America, you spend only 10% of your income on food. Isn't that great? Cheap food, cheap food, cheap food. That really mattered in 1940s. It's not the 1940s anymore. If people care so much about cheap food in this country, why did they spend almost $14 billion last year on bottles of water? Water's free, right? Yeah, I grab bottles of water when I'm running through the airport. I have to. But I don't let bottles of water at home because I'm still a farm boy. And I understand this is a bunch of nonsense. To put it in perspective, $14 billion. The country of Iceland, I just looked it up last night because there was something uh, on the TV about Iceland. The country of Iceland, their entire GDP, their entire economy is about $14 billion. We spend that on plastic bottles of water. <clears throat> So my point to you is, if you think people are so motivated by cheap food, why are they going out of their way to spend money to buy plastic bottles of water? It's because they want to spend more on the food and, and beverage category. They want, they have the money to spend. Not the poor, not the bottom, I get that. But who signs petitions? Who watches Dr. Oz? Who goes to Whole Foods? Who protests? Who influences the vote? Do you think it's the people on welfare? Not really. They don't determine policy. They don't actively involve themselves. So let's think about this as a business. We need to always appeal to, as a farming group, as an agricultural group, always appeal to that <coughs> upper group because they are the ones that influence and drive the discussion. This is Farshid. He probably never went to 
Kansas State. I'm sure he probably never finished high school. He's an immigrant. He runs the Nature's Market section of Fry's, which is a Kroger outlet, which is behind my house in Phoenix. I go there to research food. It's a good place. An area about the size of this room that's just high-end food. Funky stuff. Crazy stuff. Stuff that you and I probably would not buy. But i got to see what people are buying. Because when I go there and I see that people are paying $90 for a gallon of milk, or when I see that people are figuring out new ways to spend crazy hemp milk. Do you know there's a thing called hemp milk now? We saw almond milk, then there was rice milk. My dad's a dairyman, for God's sake. He's turned in his grave. Rice milk. It's white water. Right. Don't make any sense. Milk comes from cows. Hemp milk is the latest offering. You got to be serious. Hemp milk. You drink the fluid, you smoke the carbon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I go over there and do my research, and I, wanna, I figure if I'm going to talk to ag folks, part of my offering is I want to bring to you in Garden City, Kansas, a little bit of a big picture of what is happening in the large cities and the, the affluent consumer market, right? So that's why I go there. It also helps that at this Fry's grocery store, about uh, 50 feet from the nature's market section, is a bar. They have a bar inside the grocery store, and they have nine microbrews on tap at all times. So I get done doing my research, I go over there, I think about this, jot down a couple of notes, drink a couple of pints. It's amazing. It's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, you can do different kinds of food research going to the Garden City Walmart. I did that last night. I went there last night. I walked around, and when I was done walking around, I was so depressed, I went and got a six-pack, I went back to my room. <laughs> Farsheed, and I talked, and I said, Farsheed. Those are natural, cage-free. Those are cage-free eggs right there. I argue, because I said, well, they're in a carton. <laughs> Seems a little crowded in there to me. Uh, grain-fed eggs, which is interesting, because no other egg has ever been fed grain until those. But uh, I don't know where the orifice is, but by God, they did. <laughs> I said, Farshid, hold up that picture. Or that, that dozen eggs. I said, what's the difference between this dozen eggs and the nature's market section and a dozen eggs back in the back of the store? And Parshid says, about one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I want you to always be thinking, we in the business of agriculture think too much uh, as commodity producers. So this is maybe a big picture since I told you ag is a business. Let's challenge ourselves to get out of commodity mindset sometimes. You're going to be a farmer and a commodity producer seven days a week, scale it back to six days a week, and on that seventh day, think like a marketer. The United States of America has 25% of the world's economy, still. Even after seven years of Obama, we still are a dominant economy. We have one-fourth of the world's money and economy here, with only 5% of the world's population. Stop this cheap food crap. They don't care. Stop calling that. You know what? Look at all the market opportunities there are for us. If right, and, and you know when the time to do that is? When corn's at 360. It's pretty darn easy when corn's at 760 to just say, screw it, I'm a commodity producer. Because you know what? You could fart in the wind and make money three years ago. <laughs> but now things are a little tighter. You're saying, I'm a farmer. I don't have anything to do with this. The hell you don't. You don't sit on the board of the Kansas Corn Growers. You don't sit on the board of the Kansas Wheat Association. You can't influence investment. What about checkoff dollars? Those are your monies. Those are your monies. And when they say, we're going to do a PR campaign, and this is the one problem you have. You put a bunch of farmers on a marketing and PR mission, the first thing they do is go out and tell everybody how cheap their food is. Stop it. Start doing value added. There's commodity and there's value added. I keep telling you that there's a lot of money to be made in the value added, okay? Great example. Now, I keep up with this, I told you. I'm doing my homework so that you can just get the Cliff's notes during my presentation. I bought that bar, something I would never eat. Look at that. It's non-GMO, it's all natural, it's gluten-free, it's hypoglycemic, it's, it's just basically a twig in a package. You know? <laughs> uh, but one thing that I think is interesting that I want to share with you, Wall Street Journal did an article uh, a year ago we talked about packaging, and since I was doing a gig for a food packaging company, I wanted to do some research. When I was a kid, and as recently as five or ten years ago, the food industry hated clear packaging because clear packaging would show separation. It might show imperfections. It was better to put a picture of a perfect product on the box and then not let the customer see any actual product. This has evolved in the last year or two or three that now the consumer is going to be close to their food. Transparency. Now, whether they really understand how that kind of bar was made, just like Ben and Jerry's, if they saw the cardboard barrel of caramel, they'd freak. 
But now, at least it's a clear package, so to them that equates to transparency. These are the kinds of things. And we're not being busters. We're not taking advantage of people. We're taking advantage of their preconceived notions. This is something you think about. How do we take something that would have, you know what, put it in a clear package and you charge 50 cents more for it? How hard was that? That's what we need to think like as farmers. Let's influence the discussion as agriculturalists. Organic continues to grow. It went bad in 08, 09 with the recession because people said they cared about organic, but they only cared enough about it if it was not going to cost them a great deal of money. <laughs> you know, when the things got bad. But they're willing to spend more money now. The economy has improved since 08, 09. So organic numbers are still growing. It'll never, ever probably be maintained.